Hi, I'm Irvin, and I'm an Adamaniac. All right, welcome back. As we discussed before, Legends of the Superheroes was a sort of mini-series of two primetime specials and featured several heroes from the Super Friends universe. In part one, some of the worst supervillains of all time took part in the celebrity roast of the heroes. That went about as well as you might expect, as we saw. Now it's time for... <laughs> the Challenge. Somewhere in a secret hideout, Located on a remote island, the arch enemies of our superheroes have gathered to hatch a diabolical plot to destroy the world. <laughs> May I have your attention, please? I don't think they heard you. Try a little louder. Well, hit me. Attention. Attention, ladies and gentlemen. They still can't hear you. Master of the universe, command you to come to order! Master of the universe? You're not even master of this room. I said order! Now that I have your attention... Now they heard you. First, Riddler will call the roll. What humanoid creature was spawned in a swamp and is feared far and wide for his brute strength? Hey, Solomon Grundy. He's calling you. How I know. He talks funny. Saying, here is a little too hard for Grundy, so he'll just throw a rock at the Riddler. Let's move on, and quickly. And I mean this. What villain is the sworn enemy of the Green Lantern and uses his power ring for evil? <laughs> Sinestro. <laughs> I'm beginning to think this is a thankless job. Unfortunately for him, neither the internet nor Zoom had been invented yet, so he couldn't do this remotely. And Riddlers don't have a union, so he can't even demand hazard pay. Needless to say, Frank Gorshin's Riddler wasn't in the first part, and I'm delighted to see him here. We'll get a bunch more gags of that type, and then it's time to introduce Dr. Savannah and his latest invention. <laughs> I press the simple button. <laughs> At the end, exactly one hour. Every living creature in the world will be destroyed, except us, including our mortal enemies, the superheroes. Why? The superheroes I get, but what did I or any of the rest of us ever do to you? Plus, let's say it works. You destroy all living things on the planet except yourselves. Then what? You're stuck with nothing but each other for company, and without any plants or animals, you're all going to get really hungry. And not to put too fine a point on it, Doctor, but you're not a very big guy. When things start getting desperate, how long before Giganta decides that shiny head makes you look like a hard-boiled egg? And we will leave them clues. Clues that will eventually lead them here to our domed retreat and the doomsday machine. Leave them here? Stop, uh, but too late, but too late, but too late. All the clues will just be trapped. Somewhere in the distant future, Scott Evil is shaking his head and saying, you guys are weird. But who is now ah. best suited to arrive? <laughs> ah, to assume, to assume, to come up with clues. Ah, <laughs> the man, yes, the man of words, the artful creator of puzzles. None other than the Riddler. <laughs> right, the Riddler. <laughs> Took him long enough to say it, and it took this special long enough to give us the famous Riddler laugh, the one that can never be duplicated properly because there will never be another Frank Gorshin. Going to get a little preachy here for just a second. Mr. Gorshin literally smoked himself to death. He was a chain smoker and cancer got him. Don't be like Frank. Quit now and let your lungs return to the job they were built to do. Just kidding. But seriously, smoking isn't worth it. Think about what you get from it, then ask if that little bit of pleasure is worth dying for. 
And if the answer is yes, call a doctor and hurry. I've got it! <laughs> and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> if Shakespeare had had my mind, there's no telling how far he would have gone. It's beautiful. <laughs> I'm not sure how much further Shakespeare could have gone. By the time he died, he was at the top of his game and comfortably wealthy, and he had the good sense not to go into politics. If he had had the Riddler's brain, I suspect high school students would find his writings even more incomprehensible than they already do. I enjoy his works, but then I never finished high school. At the cave where the superheroes are, Batman doesn't seem to realize the roast is over and he's giving a nice tribute to retired man. <laughs> Same since he tried to stop that speeding bullet. You better get this room level. <laughs> That's better. I talked about William Shallert last time, and everything I said there still goes. I wish you'd quit calling me retired man. I want people to remember me by my old name, the name that struck terror in the hearts of villains everywhere. The Scarlet and. <laughs> Cyclone. Something like that. <laughs> A scarlet cyclone. That's it. While Batman is presenting whoever he is with the stereotypical gold watch for his retirement, an emergency message comes in. The button's in a secret room. Find it and you're free from doom. You'll never make it is what we're betting, cause 50 minutes is all you're getting. Hmm. What does it all mean? I'll tell you what it means. It's diabolical. Thanks for explaining that. The villains have set off a doomsday device. And if we don't find it and stop it in 50 minutes, the world will be destroyed. Where is this doomsday device? I don't know. The message said it's in a secret room. That should narrow it down considerably. Batman says we can cover more ground if we split up and all search different areas. What if one of us finds it? How will we tell the others? That's a good question. I know. There's a gas station just down the road. Leave any information that you find there. Superheroes, disperse! The most powerful beings on the planet and even scientific genius Batman can't come up with a portable radio. Meanwhile, clear back in the 1940s, Dick Tracy had his trademark two-way wrist radio. We saw Batman and Robin use handheld radios more than once in the series, but Batman doesn't want to hand those out to everybody because he's afraid someone will steal the patent and flood the market with cheap knockoff bat communicators, thus flooding his channel with idle chatter and rendering the radios useless for crime fighting. Basically the same thing that happened to CB radio in the 70s. When you were watching the show, did you ever wonder why the car was open top and anybody could get under the hood to do whatever mischief they wanted? Yeah, we all did. The first time I saw that, I said, now that makes sense. I have a feeling Adam West's Batmobile would be a lot more fun to drive, though. Like it? I'll talk a little bit more about it in a separate video. Right now, there's villains to catch. Alice, girl, you won't believe what I just saw. This guy with funny ears and a cape. Yeah, and he's with this little dude in hot pants and leprechaun shoes. Yeah, they just drove in. She'll be a running gag for a while, describing all the crazy-looking people who are coming to this silly little gas station. Whatever Sinestro did made the Batmobile break down, but there's a capable attendant on duty. And thanks to a magic hat that Mordrew gave him, they can't tell that the attendant is really Solomon Grundy. <laughs> oh, I see problem. <laughs> Loose part. Are you sure you're a licensed mechanic? Sure. Say so right here. Solomon Grundy. Except if he does that. Batman will briefly try to fight Grundy, but Robin convinces him that they don't have time for this. 
Since the car is busted, even more after he worked on it, they'll start walking. With them sufficiently slowed down, Riddler will plant the next clue. What's this? Saving the world is up to you. Find your fortune. That's the clue. He's supposed to go to a Chinese restaurant and get a fortune cookie? Fortune! That must be it! Quick, I'm trying to find a secret location. Um, can you tell me where I'm supposed to go? Or maybe Sinestro will jerk him around for a while trying to analyze his handwriting and a bunch of other stuff that lets Charlie Callis flex his comedic muscles a little. The answer, my friend, is in your palm. You have... Uh -huh. uh -huh. <gasps> That's a very interesting ring that you have there. This will have to come off. Wait a minute. You're wearing a very unusual ring, too. That can only mean one thing. We get engaged. No, that's not how this works. He gets down on one knee and asks you and then gives you the ring. You guys are doing this all wrong. The brightest day and the darkest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green lantern's light. Not bad. How do you like this one? Mary had the little lamb to fleece as white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Not only did that chant power up his ring, it also nullified their engagement. They go for their rings and Sinestro loses. There's nothing for Green Lantern to do now but keep searching. Carol! <laughs> you fool! You let him get away! At least I slowed him up a little bit. Why didn't you run after him? Why? Because it's not ladylike. Uh. <laughs> not to mention, Green Lantern didn't run off. He used his ring to teleport. Plus, Sinestro was flat on his back, dazed and out of commission. And finally, let's see you try to run in that dress. Weather Wizard will give it a go. Holy blisters, Batman. If we don't get a ride soon, we'll never be able to save the world in time. I've told you once, I've told you 10,000 times, Robin, patience is a virtue. Something will turn up. What can turn up? We're out in the middle of nowhere. Batman thinks it looks a little too convenient, so there's only one thing to do. Walk into the trap face first and hope they can find a way out of it later. It's what they do. Ah, Batman and Robin, why, I'm honored. What brings you to Honest Al's used car dealership? That's Honest Al's at the intersection of Lancaster and First, where the freeways meet in Downey in the heart of downtown Silmar, the earthquake capital of the West Coast. Si habla espanol. This is Jeff Altman all over, pouring sleaze over your head from a five-gallon bucket, but he's so sincere you don't notice. Of course, the car he wants to sell them is a Volkswagen Beetle. It was one of the most popular cars in America all through the 60s and well into the 70s, and people either loved them or hated them. Wait, let me rephrase that. People either loved or hated the people who drove them. Seriously, I went to high school with more than one guy who got himself a Volkswagen and thought he was ready for Le Mans. I never cared about having a fast car or a muscle car. To me, a car is a box to carry me from point A to point B. I never gave two hoots about status symbols and all that. I was the first in my group to get a car, and even though it was an ugly little 1962 Ford Falcon that my nephews and others swore they wouldn't be caught dead in, I had a car, so suddenly I was the most popular member of the bunch. Anyway, <clears throat> one night we were out cruising around when this Volkswagen started following me, honking his horn and flashing his lights. As far as I knew, I hadn't done anything to him, so nobody could figure out what he wanted. So I pulled onto a side street and stopped and asked him. He had just put $2,000 worth of work into his car, equivalent to about $14,000 today. My pals and I looked at each other and went, blah, 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 blah. What he wanted was to race me. He wanted to see if his newly souped-up VW with its little four-cylinder mill could beat my Falcon with the straight six. Now... I knew my car intimately by this time, and I knew even without all the modifications he could probably blow my doors off. But he was so excited and so happy to find someone who was actually willing to race him, I didn't have the heart to tell him no. As I predicted, he left me in the dust. He came away pleased as punch, and I came away pleased that he was pleased. 
I had my own fun because the moment we came off the line and started up the street, his girlfriend turned to one of our girls and said, he put all that money into that thing, and it still looks like a turtle race. It's an emergency. Now, Robin, we mustn't rush into this. An automobile is the second biggest purchase a person makes in his lifetime. Next to his home, of course. Speak for yourself. We bought a brand new car one time. Ain't going to do that again. The dealer pulled some shenanigans that we couldn't prove. The car got repossessed, and we declared bankruptcy. Ever since, I buy $1,000 clunkers and drive them into the ground. I can spend $20,000 on a car that might last 5 or 10 years, or I can spend $1,000 every year for 20 years and have a good drivable car all that time, even though it's not the same car every year. 5 to 10 years of value, 20 years of value. Decisions, decisions. <laughs> Great, the horn works. Let's take it. Wait a minute, fellas. You gotta try the heater. The heater? It's the middle of summer. Come on, Batman. There's something to what the Teen Wonder says. And now, let's watch Adam West do something that I, for one, never thought I'd see. Oh, yeah? <laughs> watch this. Let that be a lesson to you, Robin. You can never outguess Mother Nature. I want to know how many takes they did because I have a feeling he cracked up like that in all of them, so the editors just picked one. This beauty here lists for $399.95, but uh, I'll tell you what, maybe I could knock off a couple of bucks. You give me $125, down, that leaves you with payments of $36.50 a month for 42 months. Uh, it's a deferred payment price of $962.35 for an annual percentage rate of 18.5% on approved credit naturally. Here's a nice little life hack for you. When a salesman starts talking like that, wave bye-bye to him and go somewhere else. It just might save you a repossession and a bankruptcy. Don't try to unscramble it and don't ask him to because he doesn't have any more idea what he's talking about than you do. What he knows for sure is, you sign paper, he get paid. Anything beyond that is your problem, not his. Thing is, Batman only carries $50 at a time on him and his credit cards are in the Batmobile. I'm not going to try and explore the ins and outs of Batman being able to get a credit card because we'd be here all day and make very little progress. For $50, Honest Al has just what they need. Okay, guys, mission accomplished. Those fellows won't last five minutes on that motorcycle. Especially since they aren't wearing helmets. You may have heard stories about how medical professionals call them donor cycles. My wife, the nurse, verifies that it's true. Wear the helmet. Not only is it the law in just about every state, but if you believe you've got anything useful up there, I suggest you take steps to protect it. Hawkman appears at the gas station, but before he can try to sort out why the Batmobile is abandoned here, Solomon Grundy grabs him and overpowers him. Alice, remember I was telling you about that great big guy, the one with the ugly face? Yeah, well, he just jumped the one with the wings. <laughs> what do you mean, when am I coming home for dinner? I wouldn't leave here for a million dollars. I'm with you. This beats the heck out of watching TV while eating leftovers. Out on the road, the motorcycle and sidecar suddenly separate and head in different directions. The bat cycle is designed to do that, but only when they tell it to. This one has a mind of its own. Back at the gas station, Black Canary came along and Solomon Grundy captured her too. He has her and Hawkman chained to the car lifts in the mechanic bay. Ah, oh, it is so beautiful out here. Mm, so quiet, peaceful. So romantic. Just the two of us. Alone. That picnic will be another running gag. Sooner or later, everybody will run, walk, drive, stumble, or otherwise pass through their spot. It never occurred to either of them that they could have their picnic in peace if they just moved everything ten feet off the path. Next up is Captain Marvel, but Riddler says, I've got that covered. If our device wish to find, just look inside your super mind. 
Burma Shave? Burma Shave, spelled with a U actually like the country, became famous during the 40s and 50s for the progressive sentence road signs they put along highways all over the United States. The signs and their little sayings became iconic of post-war America, building up and prospering and going places. On a more local note, there used to be a gas station chain in Idaho, Nevada, and a couple of other states that did something similar. The owner went by Fearless Ferris, and he called his stations the Stinker Stations. He got the idea of putting road signs out as well, but whereas the Burma Shave signs were usually some sort of advertisement for the product, Ferris went straight for laughs. You might be driving through the dullest part of the Nevada desert, and suddenly you came upon a sign that said, Aesthetic Area, please do not eat skunk cabbage. And then there was my favorite. Next to a big pile of quasi-round boulders of various sizes was a sign that said, Petrified Watermelons, take one home to your mother-in-law. I came along a little late for the Burma Shave bit, but Fearless Ferris sort of made up for it. It must be the answer is locked inside my subconscious. But it would take a psychiatrist to unlock that secret. And where can I find a psychiatrist out here? As you can see, I've been expecting you. Would you lie down, please? How convenient. He starts psychoanalyzing Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel. Did your parents give you that name, or did you pick it when you bought the outfit? Captain Marvel says his real name is Billy Batson, and the doctor concludes that he has an identity crisis. His first your name is Marvel, then it's Batson, now it's Marvin. What is it? I mean, <laughs> after all, it seems to me that you, you are suffering from a classic case of split personality. But you don't understand. I have to save the world from destruction. And delusions of grandeur. Speaking of identity crises, he just went from English to German in less than a sentence. Maybe they need to trade places for a while. There are many manifestations of the various aspects of schizophrenia. Hey, schizophrenia. I distinctly remember the case of, of Oscar Hinckley. Hey, what a sad, sad man was he. And I okay, now Frank Gorshin is just showing off. I love it. He'll do a couple more accents, and then suddenly he's English again, apparently with no memory of what he was just doing. Unfortunately, there's no way I can duplicate it, and it's too long to get past the copyright box. I tried to play with him much as a cat does a mouse. I know, I'll let him know that he's looking for a lake. <laughs> He'll do that with a little word association. I want you to say the first thing that pops into your mind. Uh, water. Ocean. A smaller. Pond. A Tahoe. Reno. Uh, uh, salt Blank City. The Blank Tabernacle Choir. If it on a cup. Lake. Uh, Michigan. Arizona. Uh, desert. Water. Lake. That's it. It pops right out of my subconscious. He manages to pound into the captain's head that he's looking for a lake. And there's only about a thousand around here. They're in Minnesota? So Marvel takes off to search. <laughs> Next! You know, I've seen comics who spent something like two years perfecting their act, and somehow Frank Gorshin just screwing around like this is better than their act will ever be. Come on, Batman, get on! Thanks, Robin. No, the sidecar doesn't have its own engine. You can't see it, but Robin is Fred Flintstoning it down there. Solomon Grundy! Ugh. Hot man, Black Canary! You can't scare me, Grundy. I am the world's mightiest mortal. Ugh. Grundy mightier than you! So let's have the fight and prove it. No, we'll prove it with a tire throwing contest. <laughs> Captain Marvel didn't realize those were the tires that Grundy had just taken off the Batmobile. Replacing them cost 10 years of Billy Batson's allowance. I thought you'd be impressed. Ah, Grundy win easy. Ah. Ah. 
The tire landed right on the big lens of the University Observatory's telescope. Professors at the university won a Nobel Prize for their discovery of this odd donut-shaped new planet. <laughs> I don't think so, Solomon. Mine went a good 20 yards past yours. You don't have to take my word for it. Go see for yourself. Okay, you wait here. <laughs> getting rid of him that way had to be a lot easier than getting pummeled first. Even better, one of the tires smashed through a plate glass window at the law offices of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, and they kept Grundy tied up in court for the next five years. Did you find out anything? Yes, the villain's hideout is at a lake, but there's no way of knowing which lake. The one with the island. What? I heard the ugly one mention something about the island. And why are you standing there? Did you just leave Alice hanging? How rude. There's only one lake around here with an island. Hidden Island Lake. We've got to tell the others. There's no time. Oh, yes, there is. The Hidden Island Lake! Mordrew and the others weren't counting on that. The heroes are on their way, and they could get here in time. But Dr. Savannah has a potion that can make them temporarily lose their powers. And how to get them to drink it. I must be the first one here. Uh, lemonade, mister. Only five cents a glass. I don't have time for that now, son. Oh, please, sir, please. My ma is sick, and I'm raising my brother and sister, and we're going to get evicted tomorrow, and my father's in jail, and my grandma croaked, and they wouldn't bury my grandma right. until I come up with the money. All right, I'm right here. Keep the change. He'll get them all to drink it by posing as a little boy in distress, of course. No hero can resist that. I can't fly. I've lost my superpowers. I've got to get to that island somehow. Now, Batman and Robin don't have any powers. They're trained in multiple martial arts and have lots of gadgets. I wonder what the potion will do to them. Holy man, Robin! Stay, stay close, chum. Remember. Never go swimming without a buddy. It's the same with scuba diving. We won't find out what Savannah's potion does to them because they won't go past the lemonade stand. But we can speculate. Batman's greatest asset is his brain. So I think if he were to drink the potion, it'd turn him into Bubba J. <laughs> Come on, these will get us to the island. Isn't that the way it goes? You're out jet skiing with a friend and having a good time. You pull up to a random dock to pee. And when you come back, two weirdos in capes have stolen your jet skis. Then you call the police. And when you describe the thieves, they say, oh, well, uh, those guys are uh, on our side. Then you have to ask who exactly our side is and why you weren't invited to be part of it. Mordrew says, since you can't stop them, I'll lead them on a wild goose chase. Hey, Batman! Here I am! Come get me on my gasoline-powered goose. This jet ski chase is really long and, to be honest, kind of dull. Not much happens. Every so often, we see Mordrew hit a wave, and we'll cut to Savannah a couple of times for comment, but other than that, the most interesting part of the chase is ignoring the chase and seeing how the other heroes are getting to the island. None of them thought to get something with a motor in it. The world's mightiest and most brilliant heroes. Folks, in the hideout, they're loving it. I will compose a great poem about this. The world will finally appreciate me. <laughs> Three minutes, there won't be a world. <laughs> you mean, I finally have my moment of glory and no one will know. That's kind of been my point all along. They never think about the aftermath. Look around you, Riddler. You really think these guys are going to appreciate your genius the way it should be appreciated? Over the next three minutes or less, I suggest you rethink this. 
more Drew and Savannah are back. It's time to toast their success. Giganta and Solomon Grundy are doing the honors. And if you can't see what's coming, <coughs> what am I going to do with you? To the doomsday device, correct? <laughs> Gentlemen, we've had our fun. The game is done. The heroes we've outclassed, it proves what we've always said. Nice guys, finish. Glad. Every time I see him in action, I am awed by the way he tosses those lines out so naturally as if he really is the Riddler. As I said before, there will never be another like him. Uh, 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 this tastes kind of funny. Uh, I feel strange. Huh? Wait a minute, where, where did you get that stuff? From this bottle. Big that means nobody has any powers, so it should be a fair fight. Now, as I've mentioned before, I've never been in a real fight in my life. My brother, on the other hand, was a serious scrapper in his youth. He told me more than once that he'd find the kids smaller than him and beat them up, then find the kids his size and beat them up, and then find the kids bigger than he and they'd beat him up, then he'd go back to the smaller kids and start over again. I never bothered asking why, because by that time he was kind of ashamed of it. The thing is, when he was in a fight, it was anything goes. A guy had him in a headlock one day, and my brother bit a chunk out of his side right about here. The guy screamed and let go, and my brother finished the fight. Later the guy said, that wasn't fair. My brother said something that I later found out he learned from my dad. In fact, my dad was the one who told him to bite the guy. He said. A fair fight means I win. I knew that was wrong, so I did some research. Turns out it's right there in the dictionary. The other heroes arrive, and it's time for the big finish. Robin, you can handle her. I can't hit a woman. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I can. <laughs> what did you do that for? He was just getting to know her. She was going to explain all the things that Batman keeps putting off until he's older and hearing it from a hot redhead as opposed to some dude in a cow practically had him drooling. Don't come any closer. I've got my wand. <laughs> you <broke> my wand. <laughs> I was wondering where Hawkman was. We didn't see how he got there. As I mentioned in part one, his story is kind of jumbled and has been retconned multiple times. For us, what matters is whether he can fly with those wings or not, and if Savannah's potion would affect that. In the comics, sometimes he could fly with the wings, but other times he flew thanks to a special anti-gravity metal in his suit, which might be affected by the potion. I get the feeling we just had him pop in here unannounced so we didn't have to explain things like that. Look, let's talk this over. I mean, I'll moralize you. I'll write a poem. Oh, for you. Don't hit me. Don't, don't, don't hit me. Oh, oh. You're a brilliant mind, Riddler, but you're a coward. Well, nobody's perfect. Where's the new side device? Oh, is that on your wood? Well, it's up there. It's up there. Savannah says, don't hurt my device. They say, oh, it's your device, is it? Then this seems appropriate. <laughs> Take them away. And that's that. Or is it? I'm here to save the world. Well, you better get to it. According to the timer, there's only one second left. Uh, never mind. Good thing the timer is moving about as fast as you are. If you've watched this, you know I had to skip a lot of good stuff. If you're an Adamaniac, get this DVD and enjoy it. It takes all the silliness and campiness of the series, multiplies it by 20, and the crazy part is, it works. This will keep you alternately laughing uproariously and staring, saying, What are they doing? It's one of the funnest little romps I've had in a long time. I'll try to remember to include a link to the DVD in the description, emphasis on try. 
If it doesn't get there, hop over to that place we're all supposed to hate, but we order nonstop from them anyway because they're the best deal in town, even though they have a reputation for treating their employees like crap, and pick it up. You won't be sorry. I'm Irving, and I'm an Adamaniac.